Welcome to Bridge the Gap with host Josh and Lucas, a podcast dedicated to informing, educating, and influencing the future of housing and services for seniors. Powered by our supporting partners, NHI, TSO Life, NRC Health, Erdman, Sherpa, TIS, and Our Care. Find out more about this podcast at btgvoice.com. Welcome to Bridge the Gap podcast with Josh and Lucas. We are the senior living podcast at Argentum 19 in San Antonio, and we are in the home state of our guest today, Anthony. He is with Civitas, and he today is going to be talking to us about role and recruiting and engagement, his passion and his origin story, and there's going to be so much great content. Anthony, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, Argentum's an amazing conference, and the work that you guys are doing here uh, really ties in, I think, a lot about what we're going to talk about. Absolutely. Josh, you know, you're an operator in the space and you are uniquely aware that there's a lot of things that are thrown at operators, even at these types of conferences. And it's like, there's so many great ideas. What is the first step and how do I even start with implementing some of these great practices? Yeah, well, and we were just talking just a little while ago. I can reminisce back to whenever I was an administrator in the communities, I would get the opportunity to come to an exciting conference like this, I'd get to hear people talk like Anthony and other people. And you hear a lot about what you should do. Me and Anthony were talking about that right before the show. And if we're not careful, we can go back to the community and actually never implement anything. So you're just a little bit overwhelmed by where do I start? So I'm excited. Hopefully today, Anthony, we can pick your brain a little bit after we hear kind of your your upbringing in the industry and your experience some practical systems and how to get those going um, at the community level, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we talked earlier about um, how do you move people from that excitement to action phase. Um, And, you know, I've been really lucky to work uh, for two amazing companies in senior living that have really empowered me to to make that move into the action phase. So I started, I worked for retirement center management, uh, mostly a Texas-based company. I was a sales director for three years. And then uh, finally, they got tired of me complaining about operations. So they said, you know, what, why don't you give it a shot? And yeah. uh, here are the keys to the castle and, uh, you know, good luck. And and they were great. So I was an executive director for two years and then introduced to Civitas Senior Living and moved into a role, a regional sales director role with them for about six months until we as a company were really starting to have the conversation. We know that workforce is a big issue for us. It's uh, human capital and how do you get those people to, to move forward in the business and how do you find people and how do you develop people? And uh, we said, we don't really have anyone dedicating, you know, time time to that um, within our office. You know, it's a, everybody's interested in it, but it's not a full-time position within yeah. our organization. So um, I was hired or promoted to vice president of learning and development. And I think on day one, I was talking with Misty Powell. She's one of our co-founders and chief people officer. And um, she said, okay, you're going to do this. You're going to do employee training. And that's really great. But we also need some help with recruiting. Uh, we need some help with performance management. And I read this really great book, uh, Work Rules by Lazlo Bach. He was the senior VP of people operations for Google and, you know, really famous for their culture. And as a little bit of a culture nerd, I was obsessed with uh, how Google managed people and how they um, grew their organization. So I looked at Missy and I said, that's amazing. I can't wait to do that but we're gonna change my title. I'm gonna become vice president of people operations. And she's like, that's great, now get to work. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. It's great great to have those people who, you know, mentors in the organization and in, in the industry who weren't afraid to say, you know what, this is a great idea. We don't know if this is gonna work, but let's give it a shot. I love that. And you, you mentioned something that I can't just stumble over because it's a word that I think is very important when you're talking about people and that's empowerment. And it sounds like you've been really blessed to work in a couple of at least great organizations that empowered you. So let's just, before we get into some of these systems, let's talk about how important that is. And you've been blessed to be part of that. But I think that is something that's often lacking in our industry. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. I think you can pull up almost any operator and they they talk about having a high trust culture, um, empowering their, their workforce. But I'll use the example of if you have a sales director in your community and their laptop breaks, how many chains of approval does that need to go through before they get a new laptop? Sure. Um, how many missed calls? How many missed emails? To, did we just lose as an organization because a regional director, a VP, needed to approve that? Uh, when at the end of the day, I can order it on Amazon Prime, get it here in two hours, and my IT team can help set that up. So we talk a lot about that as an empowering thing. You know, when do we give people the 
the room and the resources to make decisions. It's one thing for me as a VP in our company to tell someone to go out and do that. But if I give them a toolkit and if I give them a budget to do it, it makes it a lot more a lot easier to accomplish that. Sure, and I think that's got to be buy-in from the top down because you got to evaluate that and be intentional about empowering your people. So again, I didn't want to derail our conversation, but when you said that, I thought, oh, light bulb, you know, that's a big key to all of this uh, because, you know, as we start talking about systems implementation and, and all of that, whether you're at the community level or regional level, whatever level you're at, if you're in a leadership position, talking to the leaders out there and you don't empower your people in very strategic and thoughtful ways to execute on these systems, it, it's just like fighting a losing battle. It can be very frustrating for the people downstream. Well, and that's a great parlay into our, our, our next topic, which is recruiting. I love what Civitas is doing on social media. You guys have doubled down on video content and photos and engagement. And that's got to have uh, a strategic impact on recruiting. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so I mean, you guys uh, have the perfect phrase, uh, love stories of senior living. And, and I took that back to the office and I said, you know what, I'm totally stealing this phrase from these awesome people. Um, and we have a lot of amazing people, not just in our organization, but senior living as a, as a whole. And here at our Genome, we're talking about one of our focus areas as an industry needs to be redefining our narrative. Uh, what's the story that we're telling to the world? Is it the stories of abuse and neglect that you know get hyped up a lot of times by the media? Media, and we still need to have those conversations, but we have amazing people who are doing incredible work, um, whether that's as a caregiver, as a nurse, healthcare administrators. Um, I mean, I've known some pretty awesome maintenance guys who have helped, you know, fix down AC systems in the middle of a Texas summer. And for me, that qualifies you as sainthood. So, um, you know, we we were fortunate to be able to have the resources to. Uh, we hired a videographer director. He's been amazing at you know capturing the. Uh, stories of our, our employees, and that ties in a lot to our passion program uh, of empowering our employees to be able to have an impact on the residents. And I was in a session yesterday where someone talked about the Ritz-Carlton and their philosophy of empowering their employees through, you know, I think each employee has a $2,000 budget to make, you know, any guest happy to overcome to do that service recovery. And uh, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a lot to, to process operationally. But I think it's giving people, you know, an opportunity to say, do the right thing. You know, if it ties into our mission, into our core values, then that should be the solution. How that's yeah, absolutely. If you can produce a love story, absolutely do it and do what is needed. I love, I've heard that Ritz Carlton thing before. And like anything else, when you want to implement something, when you actually start looking at how you operationalize that, it can become a little bit challenging. Um, want to move into while we're talking about recruiting, like what are some of the recruiting things that you guys are doing? And you say, you know what, regardless of whether you're listening to this podcast and you're a community that's a single community that's just struggling uh, to make it every day, you don't have a whole lot of support systems in place, or you're a big regional platform, what are some tangible things on the recruitment side that people can be doing? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give away one of my new secrets here. Um, so we've recently started what we call talent communities. Um, so we're developing 22 communities over the next two years. Um, and part of that is cultivating a workforce that's excited to be part of our organization. And so what we've done is we've opened up this talent community. So when we, you know, when the uh, pipes go up and the building starts happening, people start calling and they say, you know, when can I interview? What jobs are you hiring for? Uh, we put them in our applicant tracking system and then we're able to engage with them. We encourage them to follow us on social media. We send them our employee newsletters. So we have this group of people who are following us, you know, and that could be for six months. It could be for a year and a half, depending on the building. And they're excited to work for us. They don't even have the job yet, but they know that it's convenient to my home. Um, I've heard good things about the community. I've checked them out on Glassdoor and I want to be part of that organization. And so when we uh, achieved our great place to work status, we shared that with all of these people. And I got emails back from people who aren't even part of our company that said, I can't wait to be part of your team. And I just thought, how cool is that? And so you get, for us, it's a very digital process. We have a great applicant tracking system that we've used. Um, if you don't have that and you're on the paper process, you have your startup salesperson put a file in the office and it's as simple as you know doing a quarterly mail out or something like that. But I think it's a great way to engage with people 
So that way, when you open your doors or you get ready to staff up, you've got hundreds of people that are already looking to work in your community. And how exciting is it for them to tell those stories? And you have your founding group of residents and you have your founding group of employees. And I can't wait from five years to now to celebrate that with our new founders. Wow. So let's dumb this down a little bit for Josh. Uh, Because so basically you've got an applicant tracking system, but some people you're, you're tracking applicants, whether it's a digital process or not, it may be hard copy. So you're taking that treasure trove of network, basically creating a network out of your applicants and you're keeping them engaged with everything like you would normally keep your resident consumer side engaged on from the time you, I guess, break ground and make those initial announcements all the way through opening? Yep, absolutely. We have people who, um, I have a couple of folks that I've connected with that are looking to relocate out of state. They want their family lives, you know, in a community close to where we're building. These are business office managers, they're nurses, a couple of executive directors. So, uh, you know, they're making that move and they're gonna find us, but, we know that we're not quite ready to hire them yet, so why not keep them involved in that conversation? And some folks, we actually had one where we hired, um, we we have department specialists within our organization, and so they were able to travel quite a bit, and then once that community's open, we know that we have an executive director who already knows our systems, already knows our processes, and uh, we we call it being civitized. Um, So they're already, you know, fully immersed in the passion that we have. I love that. So you guys are a big operation, can do a lot of exciting things. Um, Do you guys have proprietary tracking systems? Is this something kind of off the shelf that people can adapt or what? No, um, I vetted out over 14 different applicant tracking systems. We decided on Greenhouse, um, which is a company, I think they're based out of California. Uh, Reasonably affordable, I don't think, you know, it's certainly not cheap, but um, for us, for me to be able to have the information and for our executive directors, our community managers, to have a system that's user-friendly to manage candidates, because that's where we were really struggling was, you know, we're running all of this overtime, hundreds of hours, the position was open for weeks, and nobody knew why. I didn't have any information, and uh, I'm, I'm not a particularly details-oriented kind of person, but I've trained myself to look at the data and to, to at least figure out what's the cause of this issue. And, and I had no idea before we had an applicant tracking system. So um, as much as I, I don't like the details and the nitty gritty part of that process, we had to bunker down and, and really put a system in place for us to manage that. And um, you know, for any Civitas folks listening to this, I take pride in saying it is the most widely adopted platform out of all of our software systems. That is fascinating. So what I'm hearing there is regardless of whether you can afford the fancy bells and whistles and technology, digital platforms, engage that applicant pool and make them ambassadors for you from from day one. Uh, I love that. So, you know, we know also, so recruitment's a big thing um, and we see and talk about, it seems like endless uh, sessions, uh, seminars that, you know, in that transition phase between that recruitment onboarding phase. It seems like so much gets lost in those early months and we just see this churn and burn um, and uh, like a real retention. Like how do we close the back door, not just for the resident side, but for our, our people. And so what what's some systems that you guys are put in place? Yeah, great question. And, you know, one thing I will, um, two, two things really quick before I say that. There is a, so we use a system called Smart Sheets. To, it's a project management tool. I think you can get it for like I don't know, it's a monthly fee of maybe 10 bucks or something. Right. They have an internal ATS, an applicant tracking system that you can build into that. So wow. you can, so anyone listening to this could get an applicant tracking system for $10 a month. Wow. Um, yeah, but then, you know, one thing that I'm particularly interested in, and we don't have a solution for this yet, but we're working on it, is from the time that I make you an offer to join our team to, you know, say you're an executive director and it's 30 days that you've got to give your notice and work that out. Um, There's really no touch points from us to you at that point. It's, you know, maybe, hey, we need to do a background check or, hey, we need to, you know, do a drug test. And those aren't particularly warm and fuzzy ways. That's the best conversation over coffee, right? (laughs) Yeah. So we don't want that to be the only time that they hear from us in that process. And that I think it's a big reason why we get ghosted a lot, why people don't show up on day one. Um, So we're trying to find a solution to how do we automate or how do we um, build that candidate experience before they even show up up on day one. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how that works out. Um, but going back to your original question, 
of the onboarding platform. So we spend a lot of time really piloting our onboarding platforms. Uh, right now, it's a, it's a paper process. I'm not particularly proud of that, but um, you know, we haven't quite found the right partner. And I think that's really important to find a vendor and to find a product that really fits your needs. Uh, one, to have a higher adoption rate amongst your managers. Uh, but two, you know, it's a it's a significant investment in capital resources for us. So um, we have, depending on the position, depending on the person's experience, but then we also have a really great uh, system where we take your personality profile and some other information that we collect during that, and we will tailor your onboarding experience based on that. So if you're a particularly details-focused person, you're going to get a, actually an extended orientation period with us just because we know that you're you're going to ask why a lot. And for someone like me, it's going to drive me crazy, but we know that you need that information to be successful with our organization. So it's a significant investment, again, in, in a trainer's time, but for that new executive director, new wellness director, even a new med tech, I mean, one day to learn an EHR and an EMR system terrifies me. Yeah. So, you know, or, you know we, we have, as an industry, have to move beyond saying, well, we just met the state requirements. You know, that's great and we need those standards, but we need to make sure that that person feels absolutely confident in every tool before we, we put our residents in their hands. Yeah, so fascinating. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about, I mean, it's kind of daunting if you look at the aging population, the number of people that we need to recruit into our industry as a whole. Uh, yeah, like, thank you for reminding us. Yeah, so it is very daunting to think about that. I mean, what is what is your strategy to um, cope with that? Because when you think of that big number, you know, whatever, whether you're one community or a hundred community type company, you have to, you're part of that big number where you've got to fill positions and there's only so many workers that are out there working right now. So, you know, we were talking a little bit offline is how do you attract new workers um, that maybe aren't in the industry? Do you guys have any thoughts around that? Yeah, so um, I'm a big believer in career and technical organizations and education. Um, as a younger person, I came from uh, a family life that wasn't necessarily the best. And I will say that um, my career and technical organizations advisor, I, I really credit her with almost saving my life, to be really honest. Uh, she taught me everything from writing thank you notes to after job interviews to how to shake hands. Um, which fork to use at dinner if there are three forks on the table, you know, things like that. That I could get that one too. Yeah. yeah send that one to me. Absolutely. <laughs> so, and, and it's hard because, it, you know, we talk a lot about millennials or the Gen Zs and it's, they're not professional enough for all these things. And I think that those organizations add a lot of value and they teach uh, younger people, you know, I don't want to say kids, I'm 26, but, you know, uh, to, to really, I think, have the skills that we as an industry need. I mean, we are so focused on, we've got to capture these hospitality skills, um, and these organizations have that. So, you know, reaching out to your local high school, uh, whether it's F FFA or the organization I was a part of is Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America, and they have interior design programs, culinary programs. Um, so we're, we're in conversations with them right now to, you know, how do we get volunteers from your program into our communities and how do we funnel those people into internship programs? Our Genom's got a big focus on apprenticeship programs. So I, I really believe you start talking about it in middle school and high school and you get those students who have no idea what senior living is, but they know that they want a career that impacts people and they want a career that adds a lot of value. But at the end of the day too, we also as an industry have to make sure that, you know, we're paying them decent wages, that there is a clear uh, path to success, whatever that looks like. Um, and it, whether that person wants to be a rock star caregiver for 25 years or, if, you know, we have one guy in our office um, and he jokes a lot uh, with our president and CEO because he's like, I'm going to need you guys to pack up your office. It's my turn to run the company now. And uh, <laughs> we love that ambition and uh, saying, OK, well, you got a little bit, a couple of things to learn first, uh, but we're going to get you there. That's so fascinating. Well, you know, we constantly talk about um, recruitment outside of our industry. I think that's a couple of very practical ways. You gave our listeners some uh, things to do. But, you know, again, if you're listening, uh, getting outside of the walls and getting outside of the norms and, and networking, you know, a lot of what we talk about on this show, regardless of what topic, it's collaboration, right, Lucas? Collaboration is key. And it's no different in the recruitment process. And there's all these audiences out there 
just like you were mentioning, we found even the universities are a huge opportunity. I am shocked, um, and, and I don't know why I continue to be shocked, but how many places that we get to go and talk with junior and senior level students that are super smart, intelligent, they're looking to apply their their what they're learning and their passion to something. And I think, I don't know about you, Anthony and Lucas, but I mean, we... I think we have a real value proposition because of the mission aspect of our industry to where almost any skill set can be applied, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the, a big recruiting topic is that millennial workforce. Uh, you know, Anthony, I'd love to get your thoughts on this 1.7 million, you know, are those, well, I think it's going to be a little bit of everybody, but I would imagine that the millennial piece of that is going to be crucial. And so how do we adapt our recruiting to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, we talk a lot about um, text, texting uh, candidates. And I think there are some HR and legal concerns that you have to talk through as an organization uh, to focus on that. Um, you know, millennials are a huge part of that job market, but I also think that there are non-traditional candidates uh, that we as an, or as an industry don't really consider. And I'm talking about, you know, recently retired people who can pick up those part-time uh, positions in your organization, or maybe even full-time if they absolutely need to. Uh, they bring a lot of value. You know, this may be somebody who is a, a manager or a mid-level executive in their company, and they can be a really great coach for the people within your organization. So we see a lot of really great um, people come out of, uh, out of different generations. Obviously, we're heavily focused on millennials because that you know those, that's just a numbers game. But I remember going to um, a lead wellness training that we were hosting in one of our regions, and one of the lead caregivers, um, she's brand new with our company. She was 76. Um, she was amazing, absolutely, you know, amazing ideas, very process-oriented person, and um, just really brought a lot of life back to the community that she was there. Uh, really kind of became the pack mom of the, the younger caregivers that we had, and it was this relationship that I really think is going to help us with a lot of our employee retention issues. I love that. So thinking outside of the box a little bit, I think you're the second person uh, in just recent conversations that has told us, hey, yeah, we need a strategy for the millennials, but let's not overlook the the older adults. And as a matter of fact, we just had a guest on our show that was talking about, hey, we're finding that a lot of the more active senior adults that are moving into communities, they're looking for stuff to do. And so obviously there's a lot of conversations you got to have around that and being sensitive to things. But um, also real quickly, I, I heard somebody just uh, a little while ago here at the Argentum conference um, talking about um, looking um, to like... Um, immigrant pom populations, overseas populations, that recruiting overseas to come to work in the U.S. Have you heard anything about that? Any thoughts around that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously immigration is a hot topic uh, right now, professionally and, and personally. I think that, you know, we really need to be in the conversation about having a skills-based immigration system for, for for us to attract the best people, uh, you know, not only from a college perspective. You know, I think universities are really struggling with uh, student visas right now. Uh, we have amazing students who are coming over. They're claiming top spots in our universities and um, they're really contributing a lot to the research and to the life of our economy but once that visa is done there's not an easy way for them to remain productive members of our society and and I think we as an industry really need to fight for that talent and we need to say that there is a place here and there's an impact that those people can have on our industry and, and I for one I think you know it's very exciting when you think about the work the medical research that happens so uh, you know being part you know whether that's your organization advocating or state or federal legislation, but really focusing on a skills-based immigration system, I think is really beneficial. Cool. One more question I have, Lucas, uh, on uh, retention uh, for Anthony. Are you seeing any um, correlation between um, career companies that are really focused on career pathways and, and helping people develop skill sets that will advance them should they want to advance and give them the opportunity to grow within a company and retention? Are you seeing a correlation? You know, that's an interesting question for me because I have probably an unpopular opinion on this. Okay. Um, I would love, obviously we would love to keep people, um, you know, as long as possible. I think you have to be realistic about just the numbers that you have. You know, say in a community you may have 15 wait staff, one sous chef, one chef manager realistic, you know, 13 of them can't be promoted to that sure. position. 
why can't we focus on being companies that are great places to have worked at? Um, and, you know, to send people into other companies and say, you know, I learned a lot from my other organization. Doesn't mean I'm not excited to be here, but there are things that we can, you know, I can contribute because of the skills that I learned here. So I, I think that there's a lot of success um, at the HR Executive Roundtable here at our Genome. We talked a lot about the career pathways and the career ladders. And I think that that is really beneficial and it's helpful. But, um, you know, it, unfortunately, we just can't promote it. You know, not everyone can be the sure. CEO or the CFO um, or the executive director. So yeah. I think that there's some opportunities there. I'm really excited about the apprenticeship okay. uh, practices that are happening now because it's a, you know, whether you extend it out over a year, there are measurable impacts that can be made and that can be tied to perform, you know, wages or things like that. But um, it gives people achievable measures to hit in a one year time frame. I love it. So we could sit in here talk with you all day, probably um, so many things. This is very impactful for our audience. I'm sure a lot of great takeaways. Thanks for taking your time away from the Argentum conference and spending it with us. This has been awesome. Yeah, I see, we see Anthony. You, you're definitely a established leader, but a young leader. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, this conversation I think is going to help uh, a lot of people, even outside of the business, get a you know, an understanding and a feel of the of the culture that's taking place at Civitas and and what you guys are trying to accomplish. Um, on, a, on a closing remark, let's talk to that millennial. Let's talk to that young person that is trying to figure out, you know, you, they're, they're watching Instagram videos and uh, social media videos that's like, follow your passion, just go after it. But, you know, when I was 21, I knew I had passion. I just didn't know what I was passionate about. <laughs> um, and so maybe just some parting words to encourage that person about, you know, maybe obviously reasons of why they should look at senior living, but, um, you know, just some sort of a direction. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we all talk about senior living as being an industry that is hungry for talent. And, you know, we really need that to, I don't, I don't want to say um, reestablish the industry, but we need people who bring, I think, new ways of thinking to how we operate. Um, and there are a lot of really great trailblazers within the industry that make room for people at the table. So I think the advice that I would give to millennial listeners here is to really advocate for yourself and for your talents. Um, it's not necessarily about what you know, but it's about who knows what you know, I think, is really in, important. So making sure that, you know, I could take a position as a sales assistant or a maintenance assistant or a mail, you know, a housekeeper at a community, but knowing or advocating and say, okay, I can do this. I do this really well, but here are some other passions that I have. Uh, you know, we were talking about, we contracted and um, hired a nurse who loved videography and did it on the side. And uh, they came in and helped us film our annual conference. And at the end of it, he said, this is amazing. I've never been in an organization you know, just surrounded by just the joy uh, of being in that collective group. And I said, look, we don't, we have, we don't have a nursing position, but we're looking for a videographer. Do you want to do that? And he's like, done. So he is a PR and nurse on the side and, you know, really pursued his passion. And I think it's amazing to say just because you have one set or maybe one degree that doesn't necessarily define or limit you. So uh, just share your talents and, you know, it's not boasting if you do it in the right way, I think. So you, have, you want to be humble about it, but make sure that people know what you can contribute to the organization. Very well said. And I think that's uh, our listeners are going to really appreciate that. And so to our listeners, we're going to connect to Anthony in our show notes. Uh, I know that he is also very active on LinkedIn. You definitely want to connect to him there and follow his content and everything that Civitas is doing there in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And thank you once again for listening to another great episode of Bridge the Gap. The podcast team wants to hear from you. If you're on Instagram, let us know your takeaways. Take a screenshot of the show you just listened to, tag BTG Voice, and we might just share your thoughts. Thanks for listening to Bridge the Gap.